Hello, everyone. I want to begin by extending a warm welcome to all who are joining us today for today's Adventist Bioethics Consortium webinar. The title of this webinar is From Guideline to Action, Caring for Transgender Persons. This webinar is coordinated by the Center for Christian Bioethics at Loma Linda University on behalf of the Adventist Bioethics Consortium. Now, the guideline in the title of today's webinar refers to the recent document developed by the Adventist Health Policy Association in collaboration with the Adventist Bioethics Consortium on the treatment of transgender persons in Adventist healthcare institutions. But before introducing our moderator and our uh, four esteemed panelists, I would like to say a few things about the Adventist Bioethics Consortium. Now, the consortium is a collaborative learning network designed to enhance service and biomedical ethics for participating organizations. The consortium currently comprises 10, 11 churches, uh, church educational and healthcare organizations in North America and beyond. Our primary goal and mission is to share practical information about applying ethical principles in healthcare. Before we begin, uh, let us have a word of prayer. Our God in heaven, we ask that you bless our conversations today with goodwill, sincerity, and truth. Help us see and understand issues that face our institutions with clarity and charity. Give us the wisdom to find solutions and the courage to see them through. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Just now, I will be posting the link to the policy in question in the chat for everybody to access. Uh, and now I would like to introduce our moderator alongside our four panelists. Dr. Uh, Jerry Winslow uh, is Director Emeritus of the Center for Christian Bioethics, Research Professor of Religion at Loma Linda University, as well as the Founding Director of the Institute of Health Policy and Leadership. He is a world-class Christian bioethicist and an even more impressive human being. Without him, we would not ha have an Adventist Bioethics Consortium. And we would like, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Winslow as our moderator today. Alongside uh, Dr. Winslow, we have Esther Lowen, who uh, lives to create inclusion by celebrating beauty, following curiosity and courageous authenticity. Prior to moving to Redlands in, in 2019, she lived in her hometown of Walla Walla, Washington with her wife and two children. Esther's professional life has been filled with nearly 20 years of pastoral and campus ministry in the Adventist Church, authoring a book about keeping secrets and earning a master's degree in leadership at a Fuller Seminary in Pasadena. Esther is currently pursuing a master's degree in couple and family therapy through Alliance University and completing her clinical practicum at the LGBTQ Center of the Desert in Palm Springs. Next, we have Alex, uh, Dr. Alex Dubov, is an associate professor with the LLU School of Behavioral Health, whose research has included mental health in transgender youth. He's also a specialist in bioethics and a certified healthcare ethics consultant. And next we have uh, Dr. Jenna Boyd, who is the director of the LLUH Employee and Student Assistant Program and a licensed marriage and family therapist. She has experience working in the mental health field as a clinician, clinical supervisor, educator, and administrator. Last but not least, we have Cherie Danielson. Cherie is a senior policy, a senior analyst for the Adventist Health Policy Association and professor of ethics and policy at Advent Health University. Her scope includes federal policy, the upstream uh, determinants of health and health disparities. Her professional aspiration is a care delivery system that gives every person a true chance to achieve their optimal wellness. I want to welcome all of you uh, panelists uh, for joining us today. Thank you so much. And the time is now yours, Dr. Winslow, Jerry. Thank you, Dr. Ma, Yishen. Um, I, it's an honor for me to be present in this Zoom webinar with such distinguished panelists. Uh, I look forward to the conversation today. Our focus is on the care of transgender persons. And let me give you just a tiny bit of background as to how we came to the document, uh, a link for which you will see in the, in the chat. The title of the document is Principles of Treatment of Transgender Persons in Adventist Healthcare Institutions. The board of the Adventist Health Policy Association decided in 2019 that it was time to develop such a statement on care for transgender persons. Why? Well, 
taken together the five systems that are represented by the Adventist Health Policy Association, which is the policy voice for five Adventist systems, takes care of about 9 million people as inpatients every year. And even though the percentage of people who are transgender may be relatively small, typically cited as less than 1%, that still means thousands of people come to us for care who may have distinctive needs because they are transgender. So let me just read a couple of sentences from the beginning of that document. The principles are intended to encourage hospitals as healthcare and healthcare professionals in Adventist health systems affiliated with the Adventist Health Policy Association to provide compassionate whole person care for transgender persons in keeping with the healing ministry of Jesus Christ. These guidelines are not intended to serve as institutional policies, but rather to encourage thoughtful care that seeks to be free of unfairness based on gender, gender identity or gender expression. Um, that pretty much sums up what we were trying to accomplish. And so in 2020, the board adopted these, the statement of guidelines that we're going to be talking about in the next few minutes. And with that very brief introduction, I want to turn next to, to um, Esther. Um, Esther, from your experience um, and your, your current studies, uh, talk to us about what you're seeing in these guidelines and your, your response. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Gerald. I appreciate it. Um, you know, as I uh, read the uh, policy um, in the last couple of months and the summary statements, I found myself um, feeling a lot of resonance and a lot of hope. Um, so thank you for your work um, to the other panelists who work on it as well. Um, thank you. Um, I want to make three observations today about my wishes and needs uh, for medical care as um, a transgender person, as a woman, as a Christian, a wife, a pastor, a parent. And um, I'm going to do that by sharing three short, very short vignettes from my own life. And obviously, I can't speak for all of us, um, all transgender people, but I'll give you kind of a flavor maybe of what uh, it kind of feels like to be in our shoes. Um, so the first is that I, I want and need my providers to be informed. I need and I want my providers to be informed. Um, items two, three, four, five, and eight, if you have the document in front of you, I think address this. Um, uh, years ago, I had a provider that I was seeing. And this was probably 10 years ago or so, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. Um, I was seeing a provider and I told this provider that I wanted to talk about my gender identity. And I, I told them that I thought I might be experiencing gender dysphoria. And it was really, really scary uh, to voice that, um, those thoughts and those feelings. It was really stressful. And it took a lot of, ver uh, it took a lot of courage to just verbalize it out loud. And, um, this particular provider informed me that um, gender dysphoria was a made up idea, that it wasn't mainstream, that it was way out in, you know, left field or right field, that it, it wasn't an accepted concept in the medical profession, and really led me to believe that, um, you know, addressing, thinking about, uh, let alone treating uh, the, the experience of gender dysphoria was not part of best practice. Um, and like I said, that was, you know, you know, 2013, 14, it wasn't that long ago. And, uh, you know, the truth from my perspective today is that that provider missed the diagnosis because they had personal bias and also potentially some ignorance around the subject. And, and so for me, some of the consequences were that my care was delayed, um, even years. I had uh, lots of unnecessary suffering because of that. Um, I had bouts of suicidal ideation, and that was just for me. You know, there are lots of other consequences of this situation um, of not being informed for other trans people, uh, whether it's based in ignorance or bias or lack of curiosity or lack of empathy. Um, you know, trans people as a whole, we very often know the WPATH guidelines. 
Um, there's a new version that was just approved, version 8, or at least has been going through committee. Uh, we have had conversations with other trans people. And so when we encounter providers that, that are not informed um, or clearly have biases, it lowers our trust in their ability to provide care. Uh, it leads us to feel frustrated. It can even feel like marginalization or oppression. Um, so that's the first. I, I need and want my providers to be informed. Um, second item is that I need and want my providers to respect me. I, I, I need to be respected. Um, and I think that the statement, um, the AHPA statement items one, six, and nine address this um, in some ways. Um, you know, it's, it's hard being a trans person in the world. Um, even in America, even in California, where I live, um, which is among the safest environments on the planet to be trans. Um, it's still, it's hard, you know, just merely existing in the world, we're faced with ridicule and disgust and overt and covert discrimination and misunderstanding and false accusations. There's false accusations um, in my city, in Redlands, on Tuesday night at city council meeting. Um, you know, there's religious condemnation, the list goes on and on. And, you know, uh, because it's so hard to be trans in the world, uh, most of us are very careful about the spaces that we expose ourselves to. So in my city, I know which coffee shops and restaurants and stores and churches and neighborhoods feel safe for me. And, and so I'm careful about where I am and where I go and when I go there. But, you know, when it comes to medical care, we don't always have a choice about who we get to see or where we're going to go. And that's if we have access at all. You know, um, medical environments are often scary for people in general um, and and for trans people, perhaps especially and, and even more particularly if we're having to go in for, you know, preventative screenings related to our birth uh, sex anatomy. Right. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes accessing care means getting bullied by people who whose desire to make a point outweighs their desire to show respect. And, you know, I don't know about other trans people that I know for me, the environment that I've been most consistently misgendered in is the medical environment being called Mr. Sir, ma'am, he, him being dead name, being called dad, husband, the overwhelming majority of those experiences for me so far have been in medical environments. Um, I remember being in a vaccination clinic um, and I walked to go out of the clinic to go find a restroom. And as I was walking by um, one of the providers, um, you know, sh sh shouted at me and said, can I help you, sir? And, you know, I, I was wearing a dress. Uh, I had a mask on, um, but I had, you know, a full face of makeup. Um, I was presenting myself very feminine and it, and it, it hurt to, he to hear that. And it was scary. And so after I stewed for a moment back with my family, I went back and spoke with this person. And I said, you know, can you help me understand what it is about my presentation that led you to think that sir was the appropriate term for addressing me? And she got really embarrassed and kind of spluttered, well, I, I'm just old school. And blah, blah, blah. And that was it. You know, trans people are brave and we're tough and we're smart and we're unique and we're beautiful and we reflect the image of God. And our transitions are holy and we deserve respect and dignity. We deserve to feel safe. Finally, a uh, third item is that I need and want my providers to delight in my transition. I, I, I need and want them to be happy for me. And I think items uh, seven and 10 in the document kind of look at some of this. Um, and, you know, because of the challenges that there are for access of care uh, among trans people, and maybe this is the most important issue, which I'm not even going to get into, whether we're talking about gatekeeping or long wait lines or whatever, um, because because there's challenge to access, um, once trans people are able to access, it, it often feels like a huge relief. It feels exciting, especially if the care is specifically related to their gender transition, right? 
Um, and sometimes it can feel like a rite of passage. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't think transition has to be somber and serious and morose. It doesn't have to be hush hush and awkward. It can be joyous. You know, recently I was able to, to access a procedure uh, for myself and, and there was a long workup. It was more than 18 months of all kinds of stuff, including demeaning psychiatric evaluations, another topic that I'm not going to get into uh, here today. And, and it's true that, that I was nervous going in. You know, I had a lot of questions. Will my surgeon be creepy or cruel? Will I, will I get misgendered? Will they take me seriously? Will they give me good care? Will they cut corners? Will they, uh, undervalue me as a person. And, you, you know, going in, I, I made a decision to kind of put those fears down and made the decision to enjoy this experience, to, to embrace this thing that I had worked so hard to be, to have access to. And I remember one nurse um, who was with me before and after, and she uh, came right up, got very close to my face with just a huge, smile on her face and she said congratulations and i can still see her face and i knew that she saw me and i cried and i cried i cried tears of joy and relief and gratitude and sadness and you know in the end i think that gender affirming care for trans people especially is a gift of life and it's a gift of joy, and it's a gift of humanity. And I see it as, a, as an amazing opportunity for medical providers to celebrate with us. Uh, so there's my three uh, vignettes for you. I, I want to be respected. I want my providers to be informed. And I want them to celebrate with me. Thank you. Thank you, Esther and Lauren. Um, thank you for your courage and your generosity to come and share with us today. Um, thank you too for staying within the time limit. Uh, well done. I'm gonna turn next to Professor Alex Duboff. Uh, Alex, I hope you don't mind if I say that you were a significant help in developing the statement that we're talking about today and thank you for that. And uh, I see your PowerPoint coming up. Um, you're gonna move, there you go. I think you're all set. So the time is yours, Alex. Thank you, and uh, thank you for this introduction. And um, uh, what I wanted to uh, do today in my, with my presentation is to discuss how uh, this statement uh, may impact clinical care and kind of continue with the topic or with the way Esther um, started us. I wanted to uh, do something similar in my presentation where I go through the, each of the statements briefly. And I know I packed a little bit too much <laughs> into the slides, but I wanted to show um, several statements related to um, each of the points made in the document, uh, statements from uh, transgender patients who received care and uh, illustrating why these principles are important uh, and why they're needed. And then uh, maybe uh, add a few um, uh, uh, statistics from the largest survey of uh, uh, transgender patients. Uh, over 5,000 patients participated in, uh, in the uh, survey uh, related to, uh, their, about their clinical care and why uh, statistically or uh, on a larger set of population, this is also important. So, um, a first uh, statement is about providing compassion and care and uh, several statements from patients from qualitative studies that I have seen and uh, from my own experience um, uh, interviewing patients. Uh, here's one statement. My doctor treat me as if I had no rights, as if I were a human. Many times my doctors have refused to treat my asthma and diabetes. They allege my problems are mental. They dismiss the symptoms I describe to them and mock me because I'm trans. Or another uh, patient describing how um, she came to be x-rayed and uh, while getting x-rayed, there were people in the x-ray window observing her uh, behind the room and uh, while she was laying there being helpless. So it's very important to, there are many instances, uh, sometimes not very clean our care uh, when we provide care to transgender patients and, and if this care may not be 
unbiased or compassionate. And this is supported by um, some statistics from this large survey, which says that 68% uh, or nearly half uh, of transgender uh, people and 68% of transgender people of color experience mistreatment at hands of medical providers. And 28% uh, of transgender people uh, reported having postponed and not getting medical care that they need um, because of that. Um, understanding the complex development of gender identity. And you can see here examples where doctors may not understand. So um, oh, one patient says at the doctor's office, I'm transgender, do you hear voices? So, um, or here's a nurse practitioner where uh, she, uh, uh, called uh, that person a male even after surgery. So um, from this uh, studies and from the survey, two and three transgender adults worry their health evaluations may be affected by their gender. And one and three transgender adults reporting to having to teach their doctors about transgender people in order to receive appropriate care. Um, avoiding uh, unnecessarily unfounded assumptions about gender identity and sexual orientation. These two concepts are very distinct and need to be not confounded together. Um, and here you can see some uh, statements from providers as well. Doctor said, you're not quite a woman and yet you're not quite a man either. Um, are you sort of in between? And here's an example of OBGYN, a provider who tried to first uh, uh, um, transgender patients uh, to be on birth control pills to fix her into thinking that uh, she was a woman again. So there is a difference between uh, gender identity and sexual identity. And um, uh, patients actually want providers to discuss these concepts and to um, uh, providers be informed um, and uh, let patients uh, guide them and uh, help them uh, to make better clinical decisions. So 80% uh, of clinicians uh, in one survey believed patients would refuse to provide the sexual orientation and gender identity information, while only 10% of patients reported they would be uncomfortable doing so. So patients usually comfortable providing this information if clinicians would ask it in a very respectful manner. Um, following professionally established standards for clinical treatment, here, I wanted to uh, draw your attention to um, many uh, guidelines available um, uh, for various aspects of clinical care and ways to care in compassionate way for transgender patients. Uh, one of the most comprehensive ones we already mentioned is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And here's standards of care for uh, health that is a uh, link to this um, guidelines in uh, in the chat, but there are also many other societies that publish uh, very comprehensive guidelines how to care for uh, transgender patients worth knowing. So uh, the Endocrine Society, the APA, American Psychological Association, for primary care, there is a great guideline from UCSF Center of Excellence for Transgender Health. Uh, all these guidelines are available and um, there are many answers to clinical questions found in these guidelines. Uh, prepare to adjust care based on new evidence. Here are a few statements from uh, patients. There was a time I had to take a pregnancy test before getting chest x-ray dis despite lacking uterus. Here's one patient also saying, treat us like women and talk to us about women's health care. I have breasts and I'm subject to breast cancer. That's not a conversation most doctors have with men, but it is a conversation that they have with women. Uh, talk about the different things that might affect a woman. Um, so it's important um, to adjust our care based on uh, what we know about the person, their gender identity. So only 20% uh, of transgender patients report being very satisfied with health care they receive compared uh, to 45% of uh, cisgender heterosexual patients. And 20% uh, of uh, transgender patients report having no place to go and seek or need advice about health, comparing only to 10% of uh, heterosexual cis cisgender patients. So uh, patients need to find a place where there is a comprehensive care uh, based on their uh, gender identity and uh, providers being able to discuss uh, with them uh, the important points. Uh, arrange the facilities that are appropriate for gender identity. Um, 
So uh, this is talking about uh, room assignments and uh, ability to use restrooms when needed. And it's uh, while there is a lot of conversation about it, so we uh, not difficult to arrange where there can be unisex ba bathrooms um, for patients to use. Um, ensure that basic care is not delayed. Uh, unfortunately, this happens uh, when the uh, patients are not provided basic care that they need. So um, here's a few examples. I don't know how to treat a transgender and patient response. I'm here about joint pain I've had since before starting hormone replacement therapy. Or another patient I laid on the ER floor with agonizing face pain, wasn't allowed pain meds because nurse said I was lying about not having a wound. Uh, and here are a few examples of what in known examples of uh, patients who did receive important care. Tyra Hunter, who died uh, in the, as a result of a car crash when paramedics arrived and understood that she's a transgender woman, uh, they stopped providing care and she died in the hospital because of the care that was withheld. Or uh, Robert Eads, another famous case where um, provider failed to address ovarian cancer and that resulted in uh, delaying important medical care and ultimately result in, in Robert E's death. Um, consult act with experts before altering ongoing specialized treatment. Um, it's for a uh, transgender patient, it's very important to receive uh, or continue to receive uh, therapy uh, that they started, including hormone therapy. And so here's an example of uh, the new doctor would not accept my medical records from the previous doctor and would not resume my hormones. So patient ended up ordering them online and uh, doing it themselves. Uh, hormone therapy treatment has been life-changing since starting hormone therapy and become generally happy and confident for the first time since I can remember. I can see future for myself. My depression has subsided. I'm not engaged in self-harm uh, and I became more engaged with family. So important to continue uh, therapy that we started. Um, for going uh, questions about, uh, unnecessarily questions about physical characteristics, uh, it happens quite often with some uh, uh, patients, 15% reporting uh, this uh, inappropriate curiosity, like in the statements you can see above. The doctor was more interested in my genitals and helping me solve my stomach problems or with the new doctor for asthma and doctor literally blurts out what parts do you have? So to avoid in this kind of experiences. And finally, seeking guidance from transgender patients about use of names. Um, and what Esther also mentioned in her presentation, uh, how important it is to um, use the name and pronounce that uh, uh, suggested by uh, patients. And sometimes uh, patients are not able to change or in the process of changing their legal name because uh, this process is very expensive and costly and it takes some time. And um, while in meanwhile, they get misgendered and call them dead names uh, because of that. So it's important to uh, show respect in this way as well. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Alex. Um, you did a great job of staying within your time limit, and you took us through all 10 of the guidelines uh, with illustrations. So that's quite a, a feat in a brief period of time. Uh, thank you for that. And I'm sure that there will be opportunity to come back and ask questions of you or the other panelists. I'm going to turn now to Jenna Boyd. Dr. Boyd, uh, you've already been introduced, but thank you for helping us today. And it's your turn. Thank you so much, Jerry. Um, my pleasure. So the first time that I remember hearing the term transgender was about 30 years ago when I was in my second year of training at, excuse me, Fuller Theological Seminary. My father came out as transgender. And, um, I, you know, I was in a graduate program and I'd never heard this term before. And um, it was surprising to me, right, that it's something that is so... Uh, such a profound experience for some people and that in the mental health field, field I hadn't been exposed to it yet. So I had to go to sort of extensive lengths to even learn about what transgender meant um, and to, you know, um, try to understand it. Um, obviously, I had a great resource with my dad in terms of being able to, uh, you know, ask um, her of her experience and learn about um, 
you know, what her journey had been. So that was um, really my introduction into the whole world of understanding transgender. But as a mental health care provider, um, it was kind of a privilege to be able to um, bring my dad in, even into my own training. My dad came and made a presentation to my class at Fuller. And um, the, the, the student body and the, the professors were really appreciative because they, uh, like me, had not really been exposed to it much and didn't have much understanding. So, um, so I'm really thrilled that um, we're talking about this policy that's been developed, or the, I'm sorry, not policy statement, um, uh, because I think this is a, a really important um, step in uh, helping to address the disparities that so many transgender patients face um, in, in terms of even educating. I think this is a policy that educates um, very nicely and succinctly. Um, you know, obviously the, the, the issues go much deeper in terms of um, being a provider and wanting to be confident in providing care. But I think this is a really wonderful starting point for that. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about as um, here at Loma Linda, um, we have identified that there is a dearth of mental health professionals that are qualified to provide um, mental health care for, for transgender people. And um, one of the issues that we come up against oftentimes is the medical professions, um, how they view the role of mental health care, because oftentimes the view from the medical profession is that it is a psychological issue that requires psychological care. And yes, there are you know, high levels of anxiety, depression, suicide, and so forth, but it tends to be less about the actual experience of, of um, gender dysphoria and more about how people are responding to their experience of gender dysphoria and their journey. And Esther, you may, you may count on me on that a bit, but in my work with, um, with different clients, that that's, it's, the distress is less about the fact that they have gender dysphoria and more about how are people going to respond to me? Am I going to be safe? That sort of thing. And so, um, so being transgender is more of a physiological issue, less of a psychological issue. And I think that's oftentimes misunderstood in the medical community. Um, in terms of e even here in my clinic, one of the things that we've noticed is um, while we can educate everyone, we can't, you know, e even if we're providing all the training, we can't necessarily determine that everyone will be without bias. You know, we're wanting to provide unbiased care, but um, uh, even the best of training does not always remove people's biases. I think we have to, you know, do our best to provide information and, and exposure, um, but I, I think we have to, we do a better job sometimes in identifying who is it that is qualified to truly be an ally, um, particularly when we're talking about mental health care. Um, and, you know, I think it's probably true medical care as well, but um, you really want to ensure that your mental health provider is going, is going to be a true ally, not just someone that says, yes, I, you know, I, I love them, I want to support them, but, right? <clears throat> People are very, very discerning of when that but is present um, and it makes them feel very unsafe. So I think it's really important that we are identifying people that, um, that have a passion and really care about providing this this uh, kind of support for the transgender community and then really providing them with the training and support so they can kind of grow in that role. Um, I've also come to recognize how important it is um, to have administrative staff be trained as well because that's the front line. That's, that's kind of the, the first you know, face that, that many people see. And if they're not feeling safe even talking to a uh, you know, person scheduling their appointment or greeting them at the, in the waiting room, um, so that I think the training is something that needs to be extended to the whole team that encounters um, our transgender patients. Um, I, I really appreciate Esther sharing her experience because I, I find both for myself and other people that I encounter that um, the personal experience of a transgender person is one of the most profound trains that you can receive because I think it really um, makes it uh, a human experience, right? It makes it something that you can find points of connection with, find points of empathy with. Um, I, I think it's it's really unfair to put it all on <laughs> the transgender person to educate us, right? That's something that we should take responsibility for ourselves. Um, but those personal experiences are, are really so profound. And, and again, I really appreciate Esther sharing her story here 
Um, but there are some wonderful documentaries out there. Last year here at Loma Linda, we showed the, the documentary Growing Up Trans, which um, shows the experience of, of people at different developmental stages and kind of what that looks like and, and how families um, you know, navigate through the challenges of, of understanding and supporting and embracing a transgender person. Um, in terms of uh, uh, providing care itself, um, you know, there's, there's lots of great um, training opportunities out there that, that we kind of have to take advantage of because, frankly, it's not happening in our uh, degree programs as much as we would like. I hope that it's happening more so, um, but what I'm in, encountering is that um, many people, you know, fully licensed um, are, are finding that, uh, you know, they have been wholly unprepared in, in um, understanding the transgender experience and knowing how to provide support. And so um, knowing that we have to be intentional about it uh, and seeking out those training opportunities. Um, one of the things that we talk about here in my office is kind of what's, what's the same and what's different about working with a transgender client versus a non-transgender client. And, and so much of the process is the same in terms of coming with a sense of curiosity, not making assumptions about the other person's experience um, and really being open to uh, learning about your, your client um, from, from their experience, but also not coming from a place of ignorance yourself, right? Um, so that, so that you know, they're not having to fully educate you about everything, but, but again, not making assumptions about what their experience is. Um, I, I remember my dad talking about how so many times people, professional people would come up to my dad and say, um, you know, you don't have to make such a big thing out of this. You can just learn to express your feminine side more and it'll be okay, right? And so again, just that those assumptions that we make that, you know, you're just being overly dramatic or you are, um, you know, causing too much trouble with this. Isn't there an easier way to, to kind of do this for us almost? Um, I found one of the big issues is pronouns. And um, I've had two people in my life very close who I've had to learn how to change the pronouns um, of, 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 from what I you know, had, had known them from before. And even if you are highly motivated and if you are a straight, very strong ally, the pronouns can be a very challenging um, thing to learn to adjust. And um, so in the training process, I think role playing is essential. Uh, because it's something that just comes with practice, right? You have to do it over and over and you have to learn to lose the language and learn to be comfortable with it. Because um, again, that's the thing that I hear over and over is, you know, like like Esther was saying, oh, I'm old school. And so, you know, I'm, I'm too old to make those kinds of changes. Or um, sometimes I will hear people say, you know, why, do, why are they imposing this on me? This is just awkward when, you know, not recognizing how we have imposed on them um, our assumptions and our, our expectations for so long. So uh, really learning to, um, to practice those pronouns. Is, it may seem like a small thing, but it's really huge. And, and if you listen to anyone who has been misgendered and how painful that can be, um, and really understand that it's not just a slight mistake, but that um, but, but can really a, be a deeply hurtful thing. Um, so um, having opportunities, I think, for role playing. I know that here in the medical school with their OSCEs, they're they're um, working to uh, have opportunities for um, you know experience working with um, in a in a role play situation. And the nursing school is doing similar thing as well. So I think those are really wonderful um, things to incorporate. Um, the other thing is educating about how forms and records are are important to be gender inclusive. And um, so, you know, the clinician going into a setting, really examining those things and saying, are we being intentional about how we are are structuring our our intake forms, for instance, or our, our documentation to ensure that we are are being gender inclusive is so important. Um, and recognizing that this is a very much an ongoing process. Um, I, I try to maintain a list of uh, um, terminology on our website, and um, I, I updated it recently. And um, the vast majority of the terminology that has changed is in the is in the gender um, gender dysphoria or you know gender identity issues. Um, and so you know we're learning and we're growing so much, and it's something that we have to be um, 
always revisiting and learning about um, what is the latest research, what is the latest terminology, what is the latest um, understanding that we're having about the experience of people um, on the, the spectrum of gender identity. Um, yeah, so once again, I just want to say how grateful I am that we are talking about this issue. I am grateful for this statement and, and what a wonderful step it is in um, helping to educate us at all different levels and hopefully something that will lead people to go deeper in this issue. So thank you so much. And thank you, Jenna Boyd. Um, really appreciate your contribution today. Um, I'm going to turn now to Sheree Danielson, uh, introduced earlier as a senior policy analyst. Also a professor, this makes me smile, a professor of health policy, public policy um, at our sister sibling university um, in Florida. Uh, Sheree, uh, talk to us a bit about what this means for a very large health system and especially on the policy front. Yeah, absolutely. Let me share my screen really quickly. Um, I am a person who wears a lot of hats around my system. Um, in addition, I work for the Adventist Health Policy Association. And what is really cool about that role, that allows me to kind of get this bird's eye view of what is going on operationally in terms of how do we act on this statement. So hopefully we can spend some time together diving into that a bit. When I was originally invited to participate, you know, I was sent this really good question prompt and it said something like what changes might be needed at the system level to operationalize the ABC statement. And I was noodling over it and I just couldn't seem to land on one prescriptive answer. And that forced me to really expand my thinking beyond the very regulatory sphere that I normally sit in and ask myself, well, what changes would an operator need to know? What would they need to know about in order to develop policies and make changes that would improve care for transgender patients in line with this statement? So I thought that for the next 10 minutes or so, we could dive into considerations and best practices that can help empower systems, and then also share some of the work that's currently being done across the five systems related to transgender healthcare. I originally titled the slide, The Journey, but I think it would be more aptly titled, How We Work Together, since it really hasn't been, at least since uh, Dr. Winslow and the ABC have been interfacing with me, a really a linear journey, but instead it's been more iterative, to Dr. Boyd's point, more ongoing conversations between the systems and the ABC. So at APA, we reach consensus between the five C-suites on where we stand on a given health policy issue, while the ABC then provides us with critical bioethical support that's needed so that we we can apply these ethics to healthcare delivery. And the goal of this relationship as we keep it going is really for us to develop those internal strategies for care delivery and community engagement. I think the most important thing to remember is that the ABC document is not a prescriptive set of formulaic actions that you can take. Um, but rather it exists to support each health system in developing our own intentional strategies for care delivery, advocacy, engagement. And because these things really are going to have to be place-based and it's going to have to be nuanced and it will have to be also grounded in the literature. So at APA, what we did is we took this document and we activated on the principles and started using them as a compass to guide our advocacy strategy. So say a given policy idea is proposed by the federal government, like uh, collecting more robust gender identity data in federal health programs. At APA, we ask ourselves, okay, would that policy idea promote wellness and access to the highest quality health care for LGBTQIA patients in our communities? If so, then yes, we'll advocate on a strategy to support that change, or we may activate to oppose a change that is gonna be particularly harmful or if we are honest with ourselves and we say, we need a bigger voice than APA, we need to get with the AAMC, we need to get with the AHA, we need to get with some bigger boys in the game so that we can really make some change, then we'll do that. So as we think then about how we get this work done, um, there are really gonna be some domains that are going to influence your work because nothing that we do in care delivery is happening in a vacuum. So there's so many external forces that are impacting how we provide high quality and compassionate care. So I tried to boil these down into five buckets or domains. The first one really is regulatory, legislative, 
obviously I'm biased, that's my world, but asking ourselves, okay, has there been any new regulations or laws that have been released um, that are impacting transgender healthcare and or health equity? The clinical or the scientific? So what updates are being done to clinical best practices? Where is more research needed where perhaps our scientific community could support health IT? Could our EHRs, our clinical decision support, or our other software be better improved to meet the needs? Our workforce and our talent, is the staff empowered with the education on equitable care for transgender patients? In the community, staying plugged in, what's happening in your local community? What upstream social determinants of health needs exist? This is something that's really close to home for us at APA. Um, some of our hospitals have been called on in times of really horrific violence to stand in the gap and restore wellness for the transgender community. And so it is important for it to not, for us not to wait until there is a crisis to be plugged in. We need to be plugged in with this community at all times. So then we have five best practices that we can use as operators. So we're talking um, mid to senior level leaders. Number one is to listen to your community. Ask yourself as a health system, have we created, have we truly been learning from and creating with our local LGBTQIA community? How might we better respond to wellness needs? And it may sound so simple, but one of the biggest shared practices that has come up in our APA meetings is the development of compassionate and evidence-backed community engagement strategies with the transgender community that shift away from that extractive old school community engagement model. And I think we all know the one that we do as health systems. Thank you so much for your response to our survey. Here's a gift card. You're not gonna see us again until the next time that we need a response to our survey but instead moving from that into true community conversation. Number two is ground all of our actions and our strategies in evidence. Collect the data that you need to answer equity related questions. Remember the power of your community health needs assessment. That is a robust source of data for you as a health system, but you're only gonna get out of your CHNA what you're collecting. So if you start collecting that information about gender identity, you may have a robust set of data that you can tap into for your community. And then finally, when in doubt, take it to the literature. If we want to know if something is a good idea, we defer to transgender scholars and scholarship that is backed by science. One really good example that I saw here across APA is just that simple revamp of the patient intake form that Dr. Boyd was talking about. Make it more gender inclusive. Make sure that the PHI that you are collecting includes gender identity or other information that better informs your internal research on potential disparities in health outcomes. Another one is to be strategic in engaging your operators and your executive leaders. This is a tough one when it comes to matters of health equity because people can get passionate and we have to know when is the right time to plug them in. So your executive champions, those will help to keep you true to your mission, vision, and your long-term strategy when you're thinking about the improvements that your system needs, but you need your operators at the table to help you figure out how to get it done. And when I'm talking about operators, I would say your director, your executive directors, maybe a VP of ops, but you want to get the people who can tell you what needs to change in the boots on the ground way. Be honest and realistic about your capacity and your expertise. Grow strategically, making sure that your workforce can extend compassionate and excellent care to the community that it serves and partner with community benefit organizations and individual experts with demonstrated experience. Um, again, to Dr. Boyd's point on the need for equity overhaul and degree programs, we've had multiple APA member systems that have had issue with that um, and have taken really matters into their own hands and say, okay, we're gonna create a GME or a residency program that is gonna give education on how to properly care for transgender patients that is both theory and also some of that simulation, um, role playing, um, just so that those uh, providers are better empowered to make more equitable uh, care decisions. And then the final one is to stay iterative. Health equity is aspirational. It's not a one-time trophy that we're gonna snag. And so we have to, as health systems, keep working every day to be a support to every person in achieving their full health potential. So I leave you with APA's diversity, equity, and inclusion statement. 
uh, the five systems are committed to extending the highest standard of quality care to all people. If there is anything that I or APA can do to support you and your system in this work, I'm only a Zoom or an email away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sheree Danielson. Um, and thank you. That's a nice segue. The, the um, APA, Adventist Health Policy Association, has um, benefited from the services of a health equity task force that has been at work over the last couple of years, addressing not just this issue, but other issues such as um, achieving health equity through racial justice. So I, I think that we'll have other opportunities, perhaps other webinars to talk about some of those other documents. But now we have a few precious minutes by my uh, clock, about 11 minutes to hear questions. Uh, before we turn to, Dr. Ma, and any questions that may have come in from, from those who are uh, participating online, let me see if there are any questions that you panelists have for each other now that you've, you've heard from each other. Anyone want to make a comment or question, or is, uh, are we ready to, to turn to the uh, questions from the other participants? I'm not seeing anyone raise a hand. All right, I'm going to go to uh, Yishan Ma. Dr. Ma, uh, have questions come in from uh, from afar via Zoom that we should be addressing? Yeah, thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, I see that a number of questions have been answered already by the panelists through the uh, uh, Q&A box, and I'm wondering if any of you would like to uh, use this time to say more about what you had already written. Okay, if not, uh, we have a question coming in about, particularly about the, uh, what, you may, what might universities and educational institutions, particularly healthcare educational institutions do to enhance uh, our training for uh, providers and our students uh, and their ability to provide compassionate care for transgender persons? I'm just gonna put that out there for any panelist who wants to address it. Some of you work within uh, education, actually, probably most of us work within education that is providing education or healthcare professionals. How can we do this better? Jana, you spoke to that a little bit. Um, Cherie, you can think about what you're doing at Advent Health University. Alex, you're pretty familiar with what we're doing here, I think. How can we do it better? Um, there may be others on the panel that are more aware of this, but I know that um, each of the schools individually here at Loma Linda have been sort of taking on their own um, projects to review the curriculum, see where more gender inclusive, sexual uh, inclusive information needs to be included into the different coursework. Um, I know the School of Dentistry and School of Medicine in particular have been very proactive about that. Um, I don't know as much about the other schools, but um, but I'm, I'm encouraged that at least here at Loma Linda, that's something that that's, there seems to be uh, some momentum um, on exploring our curriculums and how they can be more inclusive. Um, I can add uh, that there is a, a curriculum developed for uh, medical schools and approved by the American uh, Association for Medical uh, uh, Schools. Um, and uh, so there is a curriculum available already developed uh, on transgender and LGBT health. So I don't know if there is a chance to sometime use that curriculum, but um, the resource is there and it's being used in other medical schools. That's what I know. I want to emphasize something that Jana said earlier and others of you have. Um, for me personally, encountering a transgender person and listening intently to the story is transformative. And I hope that there are opportunities in our education in our eight schools in Loma Linda and in, in similar schools around the country to hear the stories personally. I, I, all of us have probably heard the old line from way back probably in the 1960s, nothing about us without us, you know that line. You know, don't talk about people uh, who represent a particular experience without having them present to correct you, to inform you, and to soften your heart to the realities of what uh, they're facing. So I would just make that appeal. Um, Esther, you look like you want to add to that. 
You'll let me know. I, uh, there's a Dr. Samuel who asked a question about praying with transgender um, patients and who, um, yeah, mentioned uh, their uh, personal um, religious convictions. And so I just want to put on my therapist hat for a moment and and sort of ask the question back, which might be, uh, you know, as a physician, what do you get out of praying with a transgender person in that situation? Um, you know, where is that, you know, motivation coming from? Um, what do you hope that they do with that? Um, uh, my understanding of best practice is uh, that uh, transition uh, is overwhelmingly successful in helping trans people reduce um, mental health, um, negative mental health symptoms, and to, to relieve their distress. Um, and so is, is prayer an alternative to those best practices? Um, so I guess that would be my, my question that I would, I would put back. Um, uh, yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, short answer would be, uh, from, from my perspective as a trans person is please don't, please don't like if you're, if the motive is to like, try to get me to not transition or to not pursue affirming care, please don't, you know, I, I resonate with what, you know, Alex's response um, about, you know, potentially uh, seeking to refer to, to someone else who, who would be more comfortable uh, with that. And I resonate with that. Thank you, Esther. Um, I, as since, since ethics is my field, and I've thought some about the ethics of praying with patients, um, I would just say that that's very sacred spiritual space, and we ought to enter it only with permission uh, and invitation. In other words, would it be helpful to you if uh, we prayed uh, is a question that can be asked. But I think even that question has to be asked in, 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 in a context of trust um, and respect. So, um, Dr. Du uh, Dr. Ma, other questions come in or where are we? Yeah, um, another question has to do with the uh, how, I think this, the question is specifically addressing uh, how Advent Health in Florida may be responding to recent anti-LGBTQI plus legislation, but maybe this question can only be, can also be expanded to include any health system who may be operating in jurisdictions where there may be uh, new legislation that might affect the care of transgender persons. So uh, any of you would like to speak to that? Yeah, I um, can only speak to this because I also work at Advent Health. Um, so APA is focused on federal state or federal bills and that bill is a state bill. So at APA, we did not have relationships with that particular lawmaker's office. We exist on more on Capitol Hill. Um, so instead, what had to happen is it be at the individual hospital level, that hospital's government relations team, um, and a hospital where we had a footprint. Now, that particular lawmaker, we do not, Advent Health did not have a relationship with his office. We don't serve the same communities. Um, so he was not open to any kind of conversation, which I'm sure if anyone has read the bill, is no surprise that that office would not be open to good faith conversations. Um, but in general, that is the space where at the hospital level, you can get involved with your government relations team and activate as a big community voice, as an anchor institution, to be honest. Uh, thank you, Sheree, for that distinction. APA is the, you might say, federal or national policy voice for five systems that uh, reach across the country. Uh, but as we all know, um, individual states vary a great deal in terms of the nature of their policy and political conversations about the topic. And um, that's that's just part of what it means to be in a, uh, a United States, I guess. Yeah, other questions or comments? Uh, we're, we're nearing, we're down to the last couple of minutes now. 
So I think I want to make sure that each of the panelists has a chance to say any last thing that you think we left out. Uh, and and, and Hish and Ma, if there's any other question that you think we can address in a minute or so, uh, bring it forward. But to the panelists, any final words? Yes, the, the thing that I kept coming back to in the um, in the statement was wanting to provide unbiased care and acknowledging that how hard it is for us to determine that we can provide unbiased care. And, and so it seems like it's it's important that we are able to identify providers that um, that are able to provide that unbiased care um, and to make that information available. Um, that's one of the things that we try to do here at Loma Linda is to identify providers that, that are committed to be a safe environment for LGBTQIA uh, patients to come and see. Um, because I, I don't think we can guarantee that we can provide unbiased care even just with, with, with good, adequate training. Hmm. Thank you, Jenna. Well, I hope today's session was an opportunity for us to think a little more deeply and mature a little further along the pathway. It's a journey for most of us of understanding, isn't it? It certainly has been for me over the last several years. And I am pleased that we've had this chance today. It is recorded and you will receive a word, I take it, uh, from the Center for Christian Bioethics coordinating today's efforts uh, on behalf of the Adventist Bioethics Consortium. Thank you, one and all, our panelists. Thank you for joining us today. And um, we, are, we are now going to sign off. Yishan, final words? No, thank you all so much for this uh, wonderful webinar.